That's a great chapter. It's kind of the start of organizing the uh, the first church there. We know Jesus started the church, but as he uh, ascended up to heaven, before he ascended, he gave a com- the great commission, and uh, the guys had to organize themselves, uh, you know, in a certain way. And you see a lot of things taking place there to, to this day that we, you know, set up uh, some some ideas in in our churches based on that. But the main thing is, you know, Jesus gave them a great mission. He gave them a great goal. No specifics, but a goal that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And uh, and then they're going to have to, you know, find out how to how to go forward with that and to reach that goal. Now, this is a sort of a continuation from last week as we're kind of going into the new year and just thinking about goals and visions and having a plan. And I mentioned last week that uh, I love to set goals. And I personally, this doesn't work for everybody, but I like to set goals that, you know, it's no big deal even if I don't achieve them, but it's still like, like forces me to go out there and get something accomplished and I'm not bummed out. Uh, about not getting it. I mean, some people have this really big, like, go big or go home mentality where everything's got to be grand and great and just wonderful, and and then there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But what I see happen sometimes is they set these un- unobtainable goals, uh, they can't reach them, and so then they take the, the go home part of that phrase, <laughs> you know, go big or go home. They say, well, you know, couldn't go big, so they just go home. Uh, I, I don't struggle with that because I don't mind setting goals and, uh, you know, if I don't reach it, yeah, I'll just set another goal next time and this time I'll do a little bit better or, or, or whatever. Uh, but it's something I want to talk about. I want to talk about a little bit more today about setting goals. I also recently preached in uh, Iola and I've probably mentioned it here a few times about uh, James 5 where he says to uh, not boast yourself on tomorrow for you know if not what a day may bring forth. I might not have said that 100% accurately, but... Uh, so there is something to be, to, to think about, about not just boasting and saying, I'm going to do this next year, you know, and it has, it has to do with a hard attitude, it's not saying not to make goals. It's not as, uh, 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 you know, you don't take it to the ex- extreme that says like, every time you ever say you're going to do something, it's a sin. If you don't say Lord willing, I'm going to do this and that, but the attitude should be anytime you do something, well, that's understanding that. I'm not going to do it if God is not willing. I'm not going to do it if God changes my plans. I understand that I'm flexible enough to understand that. But if we don't make goals, you know, we're, somebody once said, if you don't, uh, let's see, if you, if you shoot for nothing, you'll, how's it say, uh, you'll never hit anything. I mean, I guess there's lots of ways to say that, but you understand the idea. Uh, I believe that we're supposed to make goals. We see in the Bible, there's a lot of examples of people making goals, and I don't think that that is wrong at all. So, you know, the people who say, I'm going to set this big goal, and then they don't ever reach it, so they get depressed, and they say, I'm never making a New Year's resolution again. I'm never setting another goal again. Uh, You know, that's not the point of making goals. The, the, The goal, the goal of making goals, the goal of making goals is, you know, that you're supposed to, you know, have a plan and try to shoot for something. It's supposed to point you in the right direction. And it's not a do or die. A, 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 the purpose of a goal isn't to say, like, it's all or nothing. Like, I'm all in or else this, everything's over. Uh, you know, that that's not what we're about. Now, there's some things in life that are going to come that are do or die. You know, they, they're very important situations, but not that's not what setting goals is all about. <clears throat> but we do need to set goals, We uh, and it's good to set big goals. There's nothing wrong with that. I think we should try to... Uh, strive to do big things. I think the Lord would want us to do that. I mean, he says the, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed could remove mountains. You know, don't take that out of context, but it means through the Lord, we can do great things. And so we want his will uh, to be done and we want to be used as a vessel to accomplish his will. And he wants us to accomplish his will. He'll allow us to do uh, great things if we have the right goals and we are, uh, you know, the right, the, the right focus, uh, you know, long-term goal, and we set goals to get there. He's going to help us do that. All right, so then there's the other uh, equally dangerous practice of setting too small of goals where, you know, you only reach what you know that you can obtain, and so you're never going to grow. You're never going to get better. You always got to be trying to push yourself to the next level, uh, you know, in some ways, 
in some ways I like the small goals because, um, you know, it leaves room in the future for the bigger goals. <laughs> if you set it too high at first and then the goals get smaller and smaller, that seems backwards. And so, uh, uh, but ultimately you don't want to take so small goals that you, it's easy to obtain and you never stretch yourself and you never get any, any better. There's a danger on both sides. So what I want to do is, uh, I want to talk about big and small goals and I'm going to use the illustration of soul winning. So Jesus said, you know, go into all the world, preach the gospel. We're supposed to, uh, as a church and, you know, I realized that at that day there was one church. Now there are many churches that aren't necessarily working uh, together at the same time, but we do have the same goal. And we can look at just our individual church right here, uh, here and in Iola, we're one, we're one in the same team right now. And we could say our goal is to evangelize the world. Well, how do you start? I mean, where do you go with that? And so I want to use that analogy of setting goal. And I'm using this text right here. Uh, in uh, some other places in Acts as well, to talk about that goal. And then I want to uh, compare that, you know, with regular goals that we might make and the same, same, using the same principle, okay? Obviously, the, the winning souls as a church, that should be our main, our main focus. And I believe here it is, and I praise the Lord for that. Uh, that was Jesus' goal, so it makes sense that's what he'd want his church to do. Luke chapter t uh, 19, verse 10 says, for, God, uh, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That was Jesus saying that about himself. He said, the Son of Man has come, uh, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And uh, so in Acts chapter 1 here, verse 8 particularly is what I want to look at, we see the Great Commission. Of course, we also read that in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. And loosely, you could say in the Gospel of John, uh, here in uh, Acts, it's a continuation of Luke, so it makes sense that he didn't necessarily spell out the Great Commission in Luke, but he starts out Acts with the Great Commission. So let's read that real quickly in verse uh, 8 here. But ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You're going to read that whenever you get into chapter 2. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, we can take this literal command to go into the whole world and we can apply it to ourselves. Now, what some people do is they take this scripture and they take this uh, situation that's going on here and they say, hey, we you know, the Holy Ghost is going to do the exact same thing with us that he did with them. And so you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, I know we don't believe this in here, but some people will, you know, Pentecostals will rely heavily on the book of Acts and say, look, it happened to them. It's going to happen to us. The problem is we just don't see that. The Bible doesn't say that that's going to continue to happen to everybody. And history shows that for the most part, believers didn't even ever think that until like, for the most part, until about the 1900s where people started saying, we're going to go back to the apostolic faith and see these miracles and these signs and all this kind of stuff, thinking that they were going to usher in the, uh, the second coming of Christ or something like that, which is so bizarre because he says, you know, there's going to be false prophets who do signs and wonders and all that. So uh, anyway, so you don't have to take everything that we see that Jesus told that literal church at that time is going to happen to them and apply it to us. But as a whole, we're carrying out what the apostles, uh, you know, what Jesus started, which the apostles followed up on, and it's passed down to this day. Our, we still have the same goal, the same uh, function to go into the whole world. So now he literally told them to stay in Jerusalem and then said that you're going to then go reach all of Judea and you're going to reach Samaria, which was the next part that they went to, and uh, into the uttermost part of the world, which happened primarily with Paul's ministry. And, you know, although maybe they weren't setting a plan and going into all the world the way he had told them to, they stayed in Jerusalem as they were told. And God, uh, you know, eventually had to kind of stir them up with some persecution and stuff that, uh, like that to get them spread out. And so, uh, so this is a great concept because this is the same thing that we're supposed to be doing and no matter what goals we set we know as a church one of our goals is to reach the whole world and in kansas city we understand we started this work with this one goal we're going to knock on every door in the kansas city metro 
And it doesn't stop there. Our goal is to evangelize the whole world. But isn't that kind of, I mean, even knocking every door in Kansas City Metro is kind of almost too big to, you know, you're almost like, look at the red back there. We've been doing this for uh, three years. And you're just like, we're never going to get that done. You know, how could we ever get that done? Well, you know, there's an old saying that says, how do you, uh, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, <laughs> right? So point number one I want to show is this. Uh, here are some different principles on big goals and little goals, uh, big goals, small goals. Number one, setting big goals and breaking them up into smaller goals, okay? This is uh, a very uh, common thing. So let's look at some application we can get from the text here. Instead of focusing on all the world, right? Ju Ju uh, Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the world. Instead of focusing on, we need to go reach the whole world. They said, we're just going to take this one step at a time. We're going to focus on what we're doing right now. And, uh, and they began to eventually go into the, the whole world. You see, uh, Philip goes into Samaria after the persecution. We see that eventually with Paul's ministry, he, he literally makes plans and goes into the world. But he has small goals. Realizing there's a big goal that he wants to accomplish, but he's going to focus on these small goals. And this is one uh, principle here. Uh, big goals can be broken up into smaller goals. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, look at verse 21. And this is after following the ministry of Paul for a little while. It says, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit uh, that, I'm sorry, he purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So you see, he had made some plans out and he had purposed in his spirit uh, I don't want to get into it, but it's lowercase s there, and he's talking about he purposed in the Spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean like the Holy He was just the Holy Spirit was just moving him places necessarily. He just purposed himself. He said, I'm going to go uh, here, and I'm going to go there. I'm going to end up in Rome, which he does end up in Rome, but that's another story. But, you know, so there are sometimes he made a purpose, and he set out to reach that goal, and then the Holy Spirit said, nope, you're not going to go there. You're going to go elsewhere, to Macedonia, whatever. And so uh, it seems like Paul got this idea, hey, I'm going to set goals. We have a big goal in mind, but I'm going to break it up into smaller goals. And, uh, and if the Holy Spirit, you know, changes my mind and redirects me, uh, then I won't do that. Now, there's one time where he goes, he seems like set on going to Jerusalem. And they said, everybody in town, everywhere he went and told them, they're like, hey, they're going to kill you. Some prophets were saying, I'm having, we're having visions that, he, that you're going to get killed if you go to Jerusalem. So he said, well, I'm ready to go die for the Lord. And, uh, and he went. But the thing is that Paul set these goals and he broke it down into, you know, just one goal at a time. If he went to a place, you know, he's not thinking about, uh, you know, the, the whole goal that needs to be, the whole uh, uh, thing that needs to be accomplished. He would just go into that one town. Sometimes he would stay there. There was one time he stayed at a place for two years and, uh, and he wasn't a pastor there. He's just setting things up and teaching people and lead them in the right, setting them in the right direction. And, and then having some of his guys stay and ordain uh, pastors. And, and that was his goal was to just go spread the gospel. But he ended up staying at this place for two years because he's like, I need to focus on this. We need to accomplish this goal first, and then we'll move on to the other goal. We see this is all over the Bible. It's a practical, uh, practical thing here. So we can apply it to ourselves here at Iola Baptist Temple. We can't just go out and preach to the whole world. That's not a realistic goal uh short term i mean you know theoretically that's what our main goal our uh, main objective is to follow the commission of the commandment of christ or the great commission of christ so what we need to do is we go out one map at a time you know one event at a time sometimes we'll go out to a small uh small town or whatever uh and just one map but sometimes we can't even get all that map done in one time so it's divided up into smaller sections and we go out you know, you might only hit three doors, depending on how long the conversations are. Uh, but you're not like at that one door thinking, oh, man, I got too much to accomplish. I need to go to the next door real quick. 
No, right now your goal is to talk to this one person and hopefully get this person saved or at least present them a clear presentation of the gospel. That's what your focus is, is on. So you're taking a big goal and dividing it up into smaller goals. This is a biblical principle, something that we can uh, apply to ourselves. So how does this apply to other goals? And I don't know what kind of thoughts you've made in your mind, like these are the things I need to accomplish in 2022. You know, um, obviously the most important thing are our spiritual goals, but even spiritual goals, it's going to help us to accomplish some of those. And I'll talk about this more in here in a minute. If we can get some physical goals accomplished, you know, maybe health wise or, or even financially, I wouldn't focus too much on, on money, but, uh, sometimes you have to focus on those things because it'll help you down the road to accomplish your, uh, your bigger goals. So whatever goals, you know, the Lord's laid on your heart or you've been praying about or your situation. I don't know everyone's situation. You're like, these are the things I need to change in my life in 2022. These are the things that I want to accomplish. You know, you can use this same, uh, this same principle. Okay. Now I'm just going to use this, uh, this illustration, which I hope I haven't totally worn out in y'all's minds yet. But that is of my whole adventure and my desire to run 100-mile marathons, okay, <laughs> ultra marathons. Now, the same principle, all right? I know in November or in October, I've got an event scheduled that's a, that's a 100-mile, and I want to do it on foot. And I know over the last few years, I haven't been able to accomplish it. I've been out of shape. I haven't been able to. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, I need to accomplish this goal, which is a big goal, but in order to get there, I know that I can't just go out and run 100 miles, so I'm going to have to break it up into smaller goals. So I personally, you know, set up, you know, some uh, a plan, you know, January, I'm going to run every, the goal is to run every day in January, even if it's just a mile, just to kind of get me back into shape, work on my diet, things like that. Then I've got like other smaller races leading up uh, and runs, events, whatever, leading up to that in October. So it's a, you know, so it's gradually getting me bigger and bigger. And then whenever I actually run the hundred miler, guess what? Nobody goes out and runs a hundred miles. What they do is they run one mile at a time. <laughs> they run to one aid station at a time. So you take a big goal and you break it up into smaller goals. So you can apply that to whatever it is that you're working on in your life. Uh, it'll help you be sane <laughs> and not lose your mind as you're like, there's no way I can ever accomplish this. Well, because you're looking too far ahead and it's too big of a project for you. Break it down into smaller goals. That's going to help you tremendously. Maybe, uh, maybe your goal is getting out of debt. Debt really hurts people sometimes and really causes them to, uh, to be tied up on not being able to do certain things. And then they're, you know, tied to a certain amount of work or tied to, you know, who knows what, but debt can really be like a chain, uh, for somebody. Look at Proverbs chapter six. Now, uh, when the Bible talks about surety, it's not necessarily talking about just debt in general. It has to do with kind of like co-signing for someone else's debt. That's the way I understand surety. Uh, but this principle, I think, could be applied to anything that you're bound to. Like I owe somebody money. I owe. I, I think this principle could apply as well. Look at Proverbs chapter six. It says, uh, starting in verse one, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend. If thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So there's this urgency saying, I've got to get myself out of this situation. And I feel like somebody in, a, in debt that's just holding, it's just held over their, you know, their life, the stress on the marriage, the stress on just everything that they do in life. And they're like, I got to get this. And, and maybe someone's saying like, I've got to make this a priority. I've got to make this a goal to get out of debt. Well, for some people, it looks like way too big of a thing to ever you know, accomplish that goal of getting out of debt. And so what you're going to have to do is just break that down to say, well, let me just get out of this one debt. 
you know, maybe a, a student loan or some car payments or something that you've made, or let me just get out of that debt. And that'll be my main focus, you know, and some people have different plans out there. I'm not trying to tell you how to do it, or I'm not necessarily advising the Dave Ramsey plan or any kind of particular plan. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, but whatever, you know, the Lord lays on your heart, whatever you find that's going to work for you, it's going to have to, uh, it's going to have to do with just, you know, accomplishing small steps, one thing at a time. Some people suggest, uh, you know, balancing out all the debts that you have and doing like the bare minimum payments on everything, but focusing on the smallest one, which I'll get that, I'll get that, I'll talk about that here in a minute, but get just that one bill at a time and really focus on that one and not all the other ones at the same time, but just get one, one at a time. That makes sense. See what you're doing is you're taking a big goal and you're just uh, breaking it up into smaller goals. So that's the first principle uh, that I believe we could, we could think about here as, it go, as we go into the new year making goals, big and small goals. Uh, obviously, that is applicable for soul winning, and we're going to implement uh, that as well. Number two, setting small goals that might eliminate some things that hinder us from reaching our big goals. Now, I already said, for instance, uh, you know, if, if I've got bad health, you know, that might affect my church attendance. That might affect my um, ability to go out soul winning. That might affect, you know, a number of things in my life, my ability to work, and then that's going to affect my ability to pay off my debt. I mean, whatever the case is. All right, so when it comes to soul winning, look at Acts chapter 6, and we've got a great example. As the church, uh, early church there continued to move on, they started to see some growth. They started to get real busy, and they had a lot of stuff going on. And uh, because of that, there began to be a little bit of stress, a little bit of fighting amongst some people. And uh, and I'm telling you, that's when ministry gets rough. Whenever somebody's, whenever the uh, the pastors like putting out fires and trying to just like just they're just running like a chicken with its head cut off and and just n just not accomplishing anything because they're just they've got too much going on at the same time. Let's read this uh, Acts chapter six verse one. And in those days, let me see. Here, I'm going to read to uh, verse seven. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, a widow that was a widow indeed, the Bible says, you know, they had no children to take care of them. They had no family uh, and they're a widow. And so who's going to help them? Well, if they were, you know, first Timothy talks about this or maybe second Timothy, uh, if, uh, if they're widows indeed, and if Paul was a little bit harsh on which ones qualified for this, uh, if they're widows indeed, then the church took them in and took care of them. And I don't know what their jobs were, if they spent a lot of time in prayer or if they helped to minister uh, at the church or, or what the case was, but uh, the church would uh, help to take care of them and to feed them and, and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, what happened was the Grecians uh, were saying, hey, our widows haven't been taken care of. The Greek widows haven't been taken care of like the Hebrew widows. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples uh, unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's not that they were lazy and said, oh, you know, and I think the ministry sounds pretty cool. So I'm just going to just give myself entirely to the ministry. I don't want to have to go do any work or any physical labor or something like that. You ever meet a guy like that in the ministry? He's in the wrong profession. You need to get rid of him uh, because everybody, uh, you know, the job and the goal of a pastor or these guys weren't pastors, but uh, of, of people in the full time ministry should be to minister the word of God to people and to pray and to be there for, uh, you know, to lead them and all that. <laughs> and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, or Timon, I say Timon, and uh, Parmenas, and uh, Nicholas, the pros uh, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on, their hands on them 
And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great uh, company of the priests were obedient to the faith. All right, so we see that what I get from the story is that at the end, the, the end result was they were able to make a huge dent in the big goal of evangelizing and, and, and seeing uh, disciples and all that kind of stuff. They were able to see that as a result of taking care of that small goal, getting that out of the way, which didn't even necessarily seem to have anything to do with the other goal. You know, like, the, so the first point I'm talking about, you know, hey, we want to evangelize the whole world, so let's evangelize a little bit at a time. Now I'm talking about something different. It's like, okay, we need to evangelize the whole world, but we need to get rid of these things in our life that are hindering us from being able to do that much work of evangelism, of prayer, of ministering the word. You know, a pastor, uh, for instance, and I'm not saying again that these guys are pastors or that every preacher out there is a pastor, uh, but a pastor has got a job to, you know, minister to the people, to know what the people need, to pray for them, try to communicate with them and minister the word to them, to pray. Uh, prayer is a big portion of what they're supposed to be doing and to constantly be able to feed them with the preaching and all that, as well as going out there and winning souls. I don't think any preacher sh is, is, you know, should uh, uh, dismiss himself from going out and doing the main soul winning work. Uh, it's really sad to see how many pastors are out there and they say, well, I don't have time to do that. I got to do this. I got to preach. I got to prepare for this. No, no, no. You should be leading your people, number one, set an example uh, by going out soul winning. Number two, it's everybody's responsibility. You know, everybody needs to, to, uh, to, uh, do the work of an evangelist and make themselves go out there and make themselves minister in that way. <clears throat> but, you know, we've got people that are uh, more uh, more prone to that, or maybe it's their, you know, in a way their ministry uh, to, to take part in that work. And those people need to be able to do more of that and more planning for that, more praying for that and all that. So there might be some things that they need to, uh, you know, some delegating that needs to be done uh in order for them to accomplish that can hinder uh, soul winners from going out soul winning from pastors from being able to preach and pray and minister to the members and so you know we can apply this to the area of soul winning for sure and I do believe the same thing is true here like uh, both in Kansas City and in Iola uh, I am looking this year, you know, and I kind of talked about this last week, uh, but I am looking at, I'm not putting an offer out there. We're not taking resumes or anything like that. That's not how I'm planning on this happening. But I do want, you know, we don't, we definitely don't need to look out of, for seven men, you know, but I do want somebody maybe just like on a part-time basis or something like that, somebody who I can appoint to certain things to be able to take care of some things uh, so they won't be there to hinder uh, the, the, the main goal, you know what I mean? So, uh, so this is one of the things we're praying about this year that God would give leadership on this. And, and, uh, you know, even if it's somebody who is a little, little more flexible in their job that we can, you know, they can do a part-time uh, work here or oh, who knows, who knows the Lord, Lord will give us, uh, guidance on that. But not only as far as soul winning, but again, whatever your goals are this year, you know, that everybody should be part of that goal for sure. But whatever your goals are, financial, uh, you know, health wise, you know, dieting, uh, repairing relationships. I mean, all the things that you typically happen in New Year's, like this year, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. This is an important thing to learn. Now, I think that I've mentioned it twice here. And I heard that Brother David has used it at his work. And that is the uh, Eisenhower box. I can't remember the actual name. Is that about right? <laughs> the Eisenhower matrix. Okay. And, uh, and you know, I've got a sign. When I walk through my door, I've got a sign up there that has this written out so that I'll remember to do that. But it's, it's hard to remember this sometimes. And basically the concept is if you haven't heard it, uh, one time I had the board up here and I wrote on it, but basically you got things that are important and things that are unimportant, things that are urgent and things that are not urgent. And if it's and if it's urgent and it's important, that's what you need to be doing. If it's important but it's not urgent, you need to decide, hey, when can I when can I take care of this? It needs to be done, but I'm going to I'm going to plan for it. I'm going to get I'm going to make a schedule here. Okay? If it's important but it's not urgent, 
That's when you delegate. Well, let's see. If it's urgent but not important, <laughs> that's when you delegate it to somebody else. It's not really that important, but it does need to be done. I'll, I'll get somebody else to do that. You know, uh, One of the goals we have this year in Iola, uh, Brother David does a good job keeping up on it here. In Iola, it's, it's, with all the going back and forth and all, it's, it's been hard for me to get. Uh, Braden's the guy that I've, I've put over the job of uploading the sermons, uh, not, not just live stream, but uploading the, the recording. And so I'm like, all right, this year, we're just going to start with January, and we're just going to keep up on this <laughs> all the time. You know, is that an important thing? I guess you could say it is, but number one, not that many people actually look at it. And they could watch the live stream. They could come to church, right? <laughs> That's the main thing. But the, I, the, we have different reasons for wanting to put that information out there. But it is, it, it is an urgent thing that needs to be, we need to keep up on it every week. So I delegate it and I say, all right, Braden, you know what? I have you do this. You need to come to church and take care of this. And, and so he's, he's, you know, stepping up and he's going to do it this year. I really, uh, I really believe that. And so, uh, so we're going to try to get that kind of thing done. Now, if it's uh, not important and not urgent, which is probably about 90% of the things in life that we, <laughs> that we do, the real thing we need to do is just delete those things. If they're hindering us from the important things and the urgent things, if they're not urgent, they're not important, just delete them. Don't worry. Just don't, they don't need to be on the list. Running a 100-mile ultramarathon is, is, is important, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was the first thing I thought of for some reason. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, all right, number, let's see here. So, again, maybe it's, it's a wife here that has a lot of uh, housework that needs to be done and chores, and they're just, it's just piling up, and it's too much for them to handle. Guess what? God gave some great for you to delegate to which are children and it's a it's a huge blessing and so children can help out with that they can delegate certain uh certain things or hire a maid or something i don't know <laughs> uh maybe it's your office at work you know at the job uh you can delegate some things and it'll free you up to be able to uh, accomplish some of the goals that you need to accomplish all right <clears throat> now if this is gets real personal, okay? Because I've made it very clear to everybody, I'm terrible at delegating. I need to, but I'm terrible at it. I'm just like, oh, I can take care of that, and I go run and do it because I don't mind doing it, and it's, it's maybe something that I even want to do, but it's like I need to remember not to do that. So here's the thing, because you're going to have a lot of leaders in your life that are bad delegators, okay? Whether it's your boss, your parent, your pastor, <laughs> they're bad delegators. Here's one thing you can do. It will be a huge blessing to them. If you're recognizing, instead of just saying, man, he's a bad delegator, recognize he's a bad delegator and then say, you know what? I think I can take care of this situation. I think I can take care of this situation and go to them and say, hey, can I alleviate that from you? Because in my case, it's not necessarily that I'm afraid to ask or anything like that. It's just I don't even think about it. I'm just like, oh, I can do that. I can do that. And so it's a blessing. And there are several guys in here and even in, in, in uh, Iola, uh, several people, you know, that I don't want to start mentioning names, but there's people that are very dear to my heart because they're always looking for a way to alleviate something and to be a blessing. It is a huge blessing. Sometimes, sometimes I almost don't want them to take it from me because I like doing it, but it's like at the end of the day, it really is better for everybody if it's delegated. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, I say it's personal because I know I'm a bad delegator. I don't say it's personal because Oh, hint, hint, I need you to take something away from me. I'm just saying that's the reality. You have to accept the fact that not every leader is just a great delegator. All right, number three. Setting, oh, so let me review real quick. Number one was setting big goals, breaking them into smaller goals. Number two, setting small goals that might eliminate something that will hinder us from the big goals. Number three, setting small goals that when accomplished, will motivate us to keep working toward uh, our big goals. Now, that might seem like, well, we kind of already covered that with number one, sort of. But now I'm going to get a little bit more uh, detailed in that. Look at Acts chapter 8, for starters, as we're using this illustration here of, uh, of soul winning. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. 
which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had uh, the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was, was returning and sitting in his chariot, uh, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come, uh, come up and sit with him. The place of the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like the lamb dumb before the shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Uh, and who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scriptures to preach unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me uh, to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the, and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And, and uh, when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotos. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now it's interesting. It seems to me like Philip was probably thinking, you know, I've got to go into all these cities and I've got to preach the gospel. And God says, you know what? There's a guy over here that you need to preach the gospel to. And, you know, maybe I'm reading into this a little bit, but there's a lot of places we could probably look and give the same idea. Uh, but after he ends up, you know, being led by the Holy Spirit to this man and this man gets saved. I mean, how often do you have someone saying, Hey, I've got a Bible in my hand right here. Hey, can you tell me how, you know, what do I have to do to be baptized? Show me what this, this God, this great gospel verse is talking about. I mean, this is just perfect. That's definitely the leadership of the Lord. And how many times have we had out soul winning that kind of an, uh, that kind of a situation happen? You know, maybe we're like, oh, man, I got to go knock all these, uh, this whole section here, man. It's a, they gave me a huge section, and I've got to go to, and then all of a sudden we end up preaching to somebody in a car that just drove up or a person walking down the sidewalk, and it was just like, man, this was like the perfect person to talk to, and they end up getting saved. And guess what happens? It motivates you. It gets you excited. And here it says that the, the eunuch was the one rejoicing, and that's definitely going to happen when somebody gets saved. They should be rejoicing. But also the soul winners go away rejoicing. And, uh, and I think what we could some, we could take away from that is when you see one victory, I mean, here's just one man in a chariot. And I don't know how fast the chariot was going, but maybe the Holy Spirit allowed him to do like a, uh, to run like a marathon like a Kenyan and to keep up with that, <laughs> with that uh, guy. Uh, it, but you know, I don't know, maybe that would definitely pump you up too, man. God gave you that strength to be able to, <laughs> I know is that that had to be exciting. God led me here, told me to go see this guy. I saw the guy, he received the gospel and how exciting. And then he goes into these cities, probably where he wanted to go to begin with and preach the gospel to all these cities, but it probably sounded like too big of a job. And now he's just like pumped up and he's motivated to go out and do the work. So sometimes when we accomplish one thing, like a little goal, and we get that done, it motivates us to go on and to keep doing the other things. Otherwise, you just sit there with this goal. Oh, man, how am I going to do that? You know, and again, just, it's only, we're only like day, what are we on day six? January, is today January 6th? We're on day six, and I set this goal, and I'm like, you know, I'm just, you know, the month of January, I'm just going to run every, I'm going to just make sure I run every day because there's a lot of days you don't feel like running. And so I was like, I'm gonna just make myself go. Even if it's just a mile, I'm gonna get out there and run. And you know, some days I'm cutting it close and I'm like, oh man, I forgot to run. And I make myself go and I run. And then you know what, just that little bitty run, it's not even enough calories to burn like, you know, a spoonful of sour cream. <laughs> but you know what, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I accomplished the goal. 
And when you accomplish something, it gets you excited. And then you're just like, I'm ready to go out tomorrow and do two miles or three miles or whatever, you know. And so sometimes accomplishing one little goal will just help you uh, springboard you into uh, excited to accomplish greater goals. Now, this was soul winning. If we look at, hey, our job here in the city mission is to knock every door in the Kansas City metro. That's like what, 2.5 million people that we need to go preach the gospel to. And that seems daunting, you know. So we could apply some of these principles that we've already talked about. It's the fact that we're only doing Kansas City metro in itself is a smaller goal than all of Kansas, you know, or the whole world. But our focus, particularly in this ministry, is like, we're going to hit Kansas City Metro. That's too big of a job. How are, what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to do this little map, and we're going to get this one thing done. And we're just going to go day by day, soul winning event by soul winning event. And here's the thing. If we start looking at it as a job, like, oh, man, you know, we got to go do this again. What did I sign up for? You know, it's, it's, it's not going to be all that exciting. But if you make yourself do it and then you actually experience what it's like to preach the gospel to somebody, what it's like to hear them uh, receive the gospel and call on the Lord to, say, to save them, that pumps you up. That gets you excited. You're like, I can't wait till next time that I go out, you know, and I can go out a little bit longer and I can maybe get another person saved. And, and, uh, and you know, there are ups and downs when it comes to uh, soul winning. But if we can, as a church, purpose to like, you know, I'm just going to hit these small goals and then that'll excite me to do to do more. Now let me show you how that works out. I already talked about in my running situation uh, those 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 goals. How accomplishing one little just one mile even can at least get me excited enough to say, okay, I'm going to do more tomorrow. And uh, again, financial goals. Now I mentioned Dave Ramsey earlier, and I'm not I'm not necessarily promoting him. I think he has some good ideas, but um, I'm, that's another story. But but he has this principle that I heard uh, a long time ago that he called the snowball principle. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking about? <clears throat> All right, so let's say you got 20 bills out there that you're trying to get paid off, to, you know, where you had 20 places where you got debt. And it all amounts to this huge, this, this huge amount that you're never going to be able to pay off. And so I already talked about how you can break them down into smaller goals. But here's the thing that happens. When you focus all your attention on that smallest goal and you accomplish that, you get that paid off, it's a good feeling. You're like, got that debt out of the way. And now I can use that money that was going towards that debt and I can apply that to the next debt. And I'm already excited because that feeling of, ooh, I got, out of, I got out of that debt. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, but what about all this other debt? Okay, well, let's hit the next bill. Okay? And you're still trying to take care of what, what you can, but then you focus that attention on the next bill. And the reason it's called the snowball effect is because each time that rolls over into the next bill, it's picking up traction and you got a bigger amount going to the next one. And he, the reason that he is encouraging this is because he knows that no one's really motivated to go out there and just spend, a, you know, just spend their entire paycheck on trying to get debt free. Nobody's going to do that. So if you can focus on smaller goals and actually get some accomplishment and get this little satisfaction of, of fulfilling this goal, that'll get you excited so that you can go on and do bigger things. And it's like that everything in life, things that are out of control. I've got tons of this. Is another thing I've mentioned uh, because of just, you know, being a, pretty, a fairly busy person, quite honestly, everyone's always like, oh, you're so busy, you're so busy. The, the truth be told, when I'm tired, I rest. When I, I feel like burnout, I sit around and draw or do something that's totally unproductive, <laughs> okay? And the reality is sometimes you need that kind of stuff, by the way, but, but the reality is there's a lot of places where I could tidy up some things and get more accomplished. But one of the things over the last few years that's happened is I've got tons of little bitty goals around the house that I can't delegate to anybody except, you know, my kids can do some of the stuff, but some things I need to just take care of. And they add up and they add up. Next thing you know, I got this thing I need to work on the car and this thing I need to work on the uh, electric. You know, we've, we've hit Brother Austin up for a few of those things. <laughs> and I got this thing I got to do. You know, the same thing. If I will get one of those little projects done, it's so exciting. And aren't guys funny? <laughs> Maybe, I think, I really think it's just a man thing. But a guy can like, hey, you know, 
I've been asking you to hang that, you know, this is the wife, you know, politely telling the husband, I've been asking you to hang that picture for a long time. Are you ever going to get around to doing that? And then he hangs that picture. Like, how hard was that to put one nail on the wall? And you put that nail on the wall, you put that picture up, and you're like, this is a bad example, but I'm just saying this could be a, situ- a scenario. <laughs> you look at that and say, hey, look how good of a job I did. Because men get a huge satisfaction of getting something accomplished. And even if it's changing a doorknob, the other day, uh, I don't know if it was with the cold coming in or whatever, but uh, nobody's keys were working in our in our doorknob. And uh, and if everyone in the family said, like, oh, we're going to have to get another doorknob. Like, What's going on? This has been so annoying. We've been doing this for a couple weeks now. And I was like, oh, I just need to lubricate it. And I lubricated it uh, with some graphite you know, stuff. Now it works great, and everybody's happy. And I'm just like feeling like the biggest guy in the world because I actually finished a project that took me two seconds. <laughs> but the accomplishment, the feeling of, hey, I got something done makes you say, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna go get something else done. And so, uh, so theoretically, that's the case. If you just accomplish some of those really small goals that have been sitting there for a long time, just take that on, and then that'll encourage you to go on and do uh, the next thing. These are some just practical things, but not only that, I hope you kind of caught that this is like a, a two-fold message, okay? Number one, I want you to apply this to all the goals that you have for 2022 in your own life, some practical things you can learn from that. Also, some things as a church that we need to focus on and not lose sight of our main goal, which is evangelizing. Our main goal, which is knocking on doors and getting people saved. But we're going to have to break that up into smaller chunks. We're going to have to do some delegating of other things that are less important. And some of those things are going to help us. You know, if we get those accomplished, they're going to help us to... uh, uh, to accomplish our, our goal. All these kinds of things are, are uh, hopefully will be helpful. Keep that in mind uh, as you enter into this new year. Now, we prayed for some things earlier. Uh, I didn't get into like a whole lot of specifics tonight on telling you everything uh, that's going on in 2022 or things you need to pray for. But I did offer the challenge last year that you would pray every day for you know, the health of, of, of all of us to be able to accomplish all the goals we're going to have for this year as a church. And then also uh, that you would pray for, uh, let me see, I got it here. I want to make sure I say it right. So again, I don't know if you prayed every day for this, uh, this last week. If you didn't, that's fine. If you did, that's great, but keep it up, okay? I want to, we, us to continue to uh, to pray for these things. One is the overall health of the church in order to accomplish goals. That includes praying for those people who, you know, have fallen into sin or uh, stopped coming or all these kinds of things. Pray that God will forgive them and they'll get back right with the Lord and we'll know how to help them uh, with their health mental, mentally and spiritually and physically. Number two, pray for an increase of laborers, okay? We need, uh, I would like some more people to, that we can teach how to go soul winning, who would, uh, you know, want to step up and, and, and get involved and do some things. It's not to say that we don't have a lot of people, it's just we could use more. And, you know, we could force it to happen. We could start getting people in here. Uh, you know, I could pay some people off the streets to do some things, but I don't think that's probably the wise way to do it. So here's what we need to do, just pray. God's never, you know, let us down before. He sent people right when we need them with the right talents that we need and the right abilities. And uh, and we, we need to just pray and rely on the Lord to take care of those things and to step up wherever we can step up as well. But we need an increase of laborers to be able to get these goals accomplished. Number three, pray uh, for the individual projects and goals and uh, events of this new year as we put them on the on the calendar and start talking about them just pray that these things will get accomplished God will use us to be able to do them and that God will be glorified in all that and of course that his will be done if we're shooting after a goal that is uh, not something that God would want us to do that he would help us to understand that and we would eliminate those things all those things uh need to be prayed about regularly, all right? So let's all uh, uh, be dismissed in a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll lead uh, Brother David come lead us in a song. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you. Uh, what a great privilege I have to be able to serve in these two locations. I pray that you'll help me to uh, be a sufficient leader, and I pray that you'll guide and direct according to your will. 
uh, and I thank you for the folks who who uh, follow so willingly and so uh, so mightily, might, mightily. And I pray that you will continue to bless into this new year and a great year as Iola Baptist Temple enters into the seven, 70th year uh, of service, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to not grow weary in well-doing, but that we would even increase in our labor, increase in our effectiveness, and see great things done for you in 2023. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.